Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, The Struggle for Dominance. And our guest is Dr. Mohan Malik, um, Professor of Asian Security at the Asian Pacific Center for Security Studies. Welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you here again. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thanks uh, for having me on your show. Yeah, it's been uh, quite a while. We're really yes. glad to have you back. Good to be back. Uh, well, you have a wonderful PowerPoint and uh, which I think explains just a lot about what China is uh, trying to do in uh, the South China Sea. And um, let, let, let's get into that because we have a lot of really interesting slides here. Could we bring up? Um, can we have the next slide then? Okay, tell us the problem. The problem, as I see it, uh, as uh, you know, Bill, um, U.S.-led order is coming under challenge from rising powers, China, in this case, in the Asia-Pacific region, but also to some extent, a declining power, Russia. Both are seen today as revisionist powers that are trying to expand their frontiers with little or no use of force in what is known as uh, uh, gray zones. Uh, so we are not talking about the 50 shades of gray. I'm talking about three shades of gray. Uh, that's mainly in terms of uh, contested commons. Uh, that's uh, gray zones, uh, uh, financial institutions, infrastructure, dual use infrastructure projects, and um, um, regimes, laws like UNCLOS, uh, uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Then we have what I would call blue soils. Uh, China calls the South China Sea as uh, uh, its blue soil. Um, and uh, black holes. Uh, by black holes, I mean primarily cyberspace, outer space, uh, uh, seabeds uh, uh, for mining purposes. Uh, so this is where great power competition is going on. I call it three-dimensional warfare, where there is no use of force, or little or no use of force, by revisionist powers. And that poses a major challenge to US-led order that came into being post-World War II. In, in other words, this is a way of subverting, if we want to use that term, US, overwhelming US military power. Yep. In order to um, escort the US out of um, China's uh, so-called territorial seas. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well let's let's go on to the next slide then because uh, we got some really good ones here. Uh, this slide shows that uh, militarily at least, if you look at uh, uh, countries that are spending more on defense uh, um, and they're also involved in slummy slicing or expanding their strategic frontiers, uh, uh, Russia in Ukraine, uh, Georgia and China in the South China Sea, uh, and you see dramatic increase in China and Russia's military expenditure followed by Saudi Arabia, which again is involved in a conflict in Yemen. So these three countries, also if there are two graphics from uh, CIPRI, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, the first one is for 2014, and the one in green, uh, in the middle one, uh, that's 2013. It shows US defense expenditure is declining while that of China is increasing mm -hmm. year on year. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. And, and certainly Russia has, um, after 1990, the Russian military was really, I don't want to say incapacitated, but it lost a lot of its capabilities, which a lot of, a lot of which it has recovered. Yes, that's right. Okay, let's go on to the next slide then, if we can. This slide shows. This is a really interesting one. <laughs> this slide shows uh, China's rise under different uh, uh, dynasties. Uh, uh, if you click on that, uh, it should show how Chinese uh, uh, state came into being. I, I, I think this is all we can do. <laughs> okay, that's okay. fine. Um, China rose like the U.S. Uh, rose from 13 colonies to uh, become a global superpower. China rose from three warring states that were unified by Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi. Uh, that's why China is called China, named after Emperor Qin. And uh, much of China's territorial expansion took place uh, under non-Chinese, non-Han alien dynasties, uh, Mongols and Manchus. Um, 
these are the dynasties that China tried to, successive dynasties in China, built the Great Wall of China to keep them at bay. But Mongols, Xingnus, Manchus repeatedly overran China. Uh, and uh, uh, now China lays claims to those territories that were conquered, colonized by the Mongols and then the Manchus, Qing dynasty. I isn't it ironic? It was the ancient imperialist powers that built the China that we see today. Yes, it is. Really, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, Tibet was brought under Chinese control by the Qings, yeah. uh, as was Xinjiang. Really, and <laughs> Taiwan too. So, I, 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 yeah, and Taiwan as well. It's really yeah. ironic when we think about yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, up until the 19th century, uh, Hainan Island was the southernmost boundary of uh, Chinese Empire. Uh, there was no mention of the South China Sea. Uh, this whole narrative about South China Sea being part of China since ancient times. This is mid early 20th century, mid 20th century concoction. You're not going to be a very popular guy in Beijing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many books. Others have said the same thing, you know. The struggle for the South China Sea, Bill Hayton, he talks about the same thing too. So I'm not the only one. Uh, there is a consensus amongst historians that when it comes to China's claims in the South China Sea, historically speaking, that's the weakest basis for China's claims in the South China Sea. Very, very interesting, very interesting. I remember a piece that you wrote for The Diplomat, I think yeah. it was about a year ago, that really harpooned China's so-called historical defense of its position in the South China Sea. I'm a student of history. I studied history in China and outside China, so I know uh, what I'm talking about. Great. Let's go back to that slide. We just, we had it flashed up there just a second ago. The, this grand strategy, now this is really interesting for a, a couple of reasons. But I'll let you explain it. Yeah, and I identify four key principles as I see them. Uh, we have had five generations of Chinese leaders, Mao Zedong, then Tang Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping. If you look at five generations of Chinese leaders, they have all talked about this. Uh, Zung He Koli Yoshi, comprehensive national power has been in, uh, invoked since uh, Tang Xiaoping uh, assumed power in 1978 with his four modernization strategy. Yang Wei Chung Yung, this is something that Mao Zedong used to say, Chow Enlai used to talk about, you know, um, harmonizing domestic economic policies with foreign policy to make foreign things serve China's uh, growth and prosperity, which is uh, quite legitimate. You know, all countries do that, there is no exception. But Fu Kuo Changping, this is something New. This is a, this was a Japanese slogan in the 1930s, uh, early 20th century. That not the Meiji Chinese restoration, have now, exactly. Yeah. So, and the Chinese have now copied that. Uh, uh, so, there is uh, something you know they are learning from the Japanese uh, in this respect. And Her <laughs> Xiao Ta Kung is uh, uh, uniting with small countries to counter the big ones. That has been an old Chinese strategy. You know, not uh, I remember two of their Yang Wei Zhong Yong. Um, you know, to me, this has a little bit to do with like Guoshu. You know, it's like, okay, you use the forward momentum of your opponent against them. Uh, I mean, essentially, I think that's what that is saying. Yeah. Uh, and it's very, very interesting. All these concepts are, well, maybe except for number three, deeply rooted in, in Chinese culture and the others more broadly rooted in Asian culture being Japanese. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. so, some China experts would argue that no, China does not have a grand strategy. We give too much credit to China uh, for uh, having a, this long-term strategy. Um, but uh, I, I would argue that uh, if there's any country in the world that has a long-term strategy, it is China. Uh, look at Tang Xiaoping's four modernization strategy that no China expert put his or her money on its success. Mm. But Deng Xiaoping's four modernization strategy on really 1978, that's agriculture, modernization of agriculture, industry, science four and technology, defense, four modernization. That achieved its goals of quadrupling China's GDP five years before the target year of 2000, 1995, China was able to achieve those goals. No China expert, pick up, you know, Harvard Business Review, no economist put his or her money on China emerging as a global economic superpower that it is today. I, um, I think you make this point later in the, in the slide, but let, let's just jump onto it now. China has a great ability to think long term. It has great patience and it can be very, very methodical. 
Um, and, you know, I, I learned a lesson in the Vietnam War. I spent two years in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Never underestimate Asian people. Yeah. Never, never. Let's move on to the next slide here. Well, this uh, slide is interesting. This uh, puts uh, um, China's territorial disputes in um, its proper context. Um, as I said earlier, that I studied history in China, you know, in the early 80s. Uh, and in Chinese history textbooks, every time they talked about Chiang Kai-shek, they called him fascist, running dog of imperialism, Chiang Kai-shek, um, traitor, my coach, uh, Chiang Chie she Right, 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 right. So Maoist China, communist China, disowned the legacy of Chiang Kai-shek, distanced itself, the new China distanced itself from the old China of KMT, Kuomintang, uh -huh. right? In everything except one thing. Yes. Maps that Maps. were drawn by Chiang Kai-shek when he was not even in control of China's heartland. His cartographers were drawing maps that showed more than half of Asia as part of China's lost territories. So these maps were disowned by Chow and Lai at the Bandung conference. So Karno and Nehru asked Chow and Lai about these old maps. Chow and Lai said to them, don't worry about these old maps. We haven't had the time to look at these uh, maps. The Chiang Kai-shek's China existed only on paper. We're going to revise them. And now these old maps of fascist Kuomintang produced in 1938 by the Ministry of Interior are being reproduced in China to show that China needs to recover all these lost territories. So what you're saying is, I think it's pretty clear, but just in case there's a, uh, some mistake, is that uh, there's a huge contradiction here. Um, Zhou Enlai, as you said, discounted the validity of those maps. Today's China is saying those are valid and they're basing uh, especially a lot of the claims in the South China Sea on these maps. Yeah, I mean, China has certainly solved its uh, territorial disputes, uh, land borders with 12 out of 14 countries. Right. Uh, only the ones with India and Bhutan remain to be resolved. Um, so uh, one could say that China is not claiming everything that KMT laid claim to mm -hmm. having resolved its territorial disputes. But uh, as far as maritime disputes are concerned, these are not much different from what Kuomintang was claiming. Side question Is today's China fascist? <laughs> I wouldn't go to that extent. Uh, China is a hyper-nationalist. What is this doing? The reproduction of these maps is fueling nationalism, mm -hmm. um, especially amongst netizens. Right. Uh, China has about 600 million people on the internet. Right. Uh, and uh, China uh, does not have internet, actually. China has chinternet, <laughs> internet with <laughs> Chinese characteristics. Chinternet. So, I like so, that. Uh, Chinese government, since uh, uh, 1989, Tiananmen Massacre, has unveiled patriotic education as part of Aiko Chiaoyu, patriotic education campaign, fueled a sense of nationalism, hyper-nationalism, that's, that's narrowing its room for maneuver in terms of resolution of this land and maritime disputes. So, use of nationalism following the collapse of communism, the end of Maoism. Nationalism is the glue that holds the country together and Chinese Communist Party seeks its legitimacy to govern China. Its two sources of legitimacy are economic growth, sustained high economic growth rate and nationalism, a hyper-nationalism. That's where it is coming from. As we were joking before the show, Markets replace marks. Yes. Good. On that note, we're going to take a break here. You're watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. We're having a really great discussion here with Dr. Mohan Malek, uh, Professor of Asian Security at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. He's got a great PowerPoint. He's taking us through point by point, and it's extremely educational and it's very insightful. So you do not want to go away because we'll be back in one minute and continue. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. 
Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on Think Tech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Aloha! Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at Think Tech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Mohan Malek, Professor of Asia Security at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, right there in Waikiki. Um, our show today, The Struggle for Dominance, and it's a really great discussion that we're having here, laying out the ways in which China is trying to supplant the U.S. in the far Western Pacific. Let's go back to our next slide here, if we can. Okay, ancient trade routes. Uh, you've all uh, heard of uh, China's Maritime Silk Road strategy. This is uh, known now as uh, One Belt, One Road. Actually, this is a new framework for what China has been doing for the last two decades or so. Um, through its Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Central Asia, Eurasia, through its closer ties with Russia, and what was known as the String of Pearls uh, in, through the Indian Ocean Sea Lines of Communication. Uh, now it's called Maritime Silk Road. I call it Maritime Silk Road 2. Point, or String of Pearls 2.0 uh, because uh, uh, this shows that uh, China is uh, uh, talking of uh, uh, developing capability, and that's what uh, you know. History tells us that rising powers always do. Um, what was it that led to the colonization of Asia, Africa, Latin America in the 18th and 19th centuries? It was not the white man's burden. It was a search for resources to fuel industrialization. Mm maintain economic growth in European countries, markets to dump manufactured goods, and then came the basis to protect resources and markets. Resources, markets, and basis. These three always go together. You cannot have one without the other. That's exactly what China is doing today. Chinese foreign policy is driven by the quest for resources, markets, and basis. And that's uh, classic what Mahan you call RMB. RMB. Okay. Renmin, which is also named for Chinese Renminbi. currency. <laughs> <laughs> which is a name for Chinese currency too, you know. Renminbi. Uh, it's all about money at the end of the day. Well, really what you're saying is what China is doing today is what Western powers and the United States and Japan and Russia were doing in the 1800s. That's my argument is simple. China is not doing anything that's different from other rising powers have done in the past. The pendulum of history has swung. Mm. It's also interesting to me a couple a couple you know things when I see that map about the Asian trade routes. Um, if you it, could bring that up, uh, if, if we could bring that up again, it, does this have the ability to somewhat pull Europe away from the United States? If you look at uh, China's maritime Silk Road and uh, uh, Belt, it touches all continents except the Americas. Mm. Um, also, if you look at uh, China's view of the China looks back to its past to chart its future. If you look at China's view of the past, as indicated in this uh, one belt, one road, um, this is not how the real world operated in the good old uh, uh, days. You know, it was much more complicated. There were, as the first slide shows, there we had the Silk Road, we had the Spice road to, uh, then we had all kinds of connectivity through Central Asia, Middle East, all the way going to uh, different countries in Asia. But if you look at China's One Belt, One Road, it simplifies what was a very complex reality of ancient trade routes. Very, no, it's very, very interesting, uh, especially the point about China looking to the past as a roadmap to the future. And, and, and Chinese, I think especially Chinese leaders, they're very in tune with Chinese history. Um, but it, it is, a, but it's, and in a way, it's kind of a contradiction. Yes, they will look to the past for the future, but then, hey, isn't Chinese society supposed to be linear and moving forward? I, I mean, in a way, it's a kind of a contradiction. Yeah, I mean, China is using its uh, version of history uh, to uh, 
go in a certain direction and to get other countries' support for mm. its domestic and foreign policy. Right. So China is interpreting its past right. to garner support for its foreign policy. Mm. When I look at Chinese policy in Southeast Asia especially, I mean, it's just trying to create the sort of situation that existed there um, before um, the, the first Sino-Japanese War. Um, if it were another country doing it, China would call it hegemonism, uh, right? Um, when China does it, no, it's just setting historical records straight. Mm. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, this uh, slide further illustrates the point that I earlier made that uh, uh, if you want to understand the geopolitics of uh, Asia Pacific today, you have to go back to classics, Mackinder, Mahan, Sunzi, Kotilia. Uh, China has long been worried about, since Hu Jintao talked about China's Malacca dilemma, uh, U.S. blockade of China's vital sea lines of communication, especially through the Malacca Straits or the South China Sea. And that's why China is laser focused on developing capabilities Abilities, diversifying its energy and trade routes. If you look at those uh, five fingers, these are just as Britain and Russia used modern transportation technology in the 19th century. China today is employing modern transportation technology, railroads, high-speed railways, pipelines, expressways, it's building, hundreds of billions of dollars China is spending in Eurasia, Central Asia. These, this is what I call China's economic hub and spoke strategy. U.S. has hub and spokes alliance strategy. U.S. is the hub and all these alliances with Japan, Australia, Philippines, South Korea, uh, Thailand. China is building its economic hub and spoke strategy that will see the rise of China as the center of economic growth. China will be the main engine of economic growth. And all these routes will bring in arteries, if you like, will bring in resources, natural resources, oil, gas, minerals into China and export Chinese manufactured goods to those regions, Central Asia, Eurasia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and beyond. Mm. This is China's economic hub and spoke strategy. You know, one of these five fingers here runs through Kazakhstan, and um, th there seems to be, um, although while on one hand Russia and China seem to be friendly, there, there are certain issues that exist between them. And one of the biggest ones, uh, uh, from my understanding, is they're both really struggling for predominant influence in Kazakhstan. Um, what's your take on that? Um, it's Kazakhstan as well as uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, all these uh, f former Soviet republics are uh, now the playground for Russian-Chinese rivalry for influence. If you look at over the last five years, China has gained enormous leverage, influence at the expense of Russia. Right. Russia seems to have given up on competing with China because Chinese state-owned enterprises have deep pockets. Mm -hmm. Russian economy is the size of India's economy, mm -hmm. two trillion dollars compared with China's 10 trillion dollars. Right. China has deep pockets. China is investing heavily all these countries in Central Asia, all the pipelines, Kazakhstan-China pipeline, that have been built, completed. It's been built, paid for by the Chinese, for the Chinese. So there used to be a time when all the roads used to lead to Moscow. Now they all go to Xinjiang, Shanghai, and Beijing. So China has gained enormous influence at the expense of Russia. Russia is now increasingly playing settled, second fiddle to China little in brother. Asia, little brother. So in a complete reversal of roles from the 50s when the Soviet Union was a big brother and China was the younger brother. And that's what uh, led to Sino-Soviet rupture between Khrushchev and Mao. Uh, uh, China, now it's the other way around. China is the big brother and Russia is, play, is playing second fiddle, mainly because it's got nowhere else to go. In, in terms of longevity, to that relationship. Do you have any prediction? Um, the worst case scenario is that uh, Russia will become China's Canada. Mm. Uh, play second fiddle to uh, China. Uh, a few years ago, you know, 
Putin went to Vladivostok and uh, told his compatriots that if they don't get the economic act together, soon they'll be speaking Chinese. That is Russia's long-term geopolitical concern vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. Um, but do not underestimate Russian nationalism. Mm -hmm. And I believe that post-Putin, this is a marriage of convenience. It won't last for long mm -hmm. between Russia and China. If you look at countries that are balancing China in Asia, they are being owned by both the US and Russia. Russia is providing six kilo sub class submarines Vietnam. to Vietnam. Russia is offering military assistance to India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. And this irks China, doesn't it? This, of course. This, especially that Indian or uh, Russian connection, the yes. Vietnam connection. Yeah. So Russia is playing its own hedging strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. Mm. Um, but if Russia is unable to uh, get its act together in terms of domestic ec economic act uh, together, uh, there is a possibility that Russia uh, could, because of its shrinking ec economy and uh, uh, shrinking population, demographics um, are changing too in Russia's, uh, much to Russia's disadvantage. In 20, 30, 40 years time, Russia is not going to be the most top 10 populous countries in the world, mm, it disappears. Right. So economically, demographically shrink shrinking Russia may have no option but to play second fiddle to China. Mm. It could become China's Canada. Let, let's take a look at, th this slide struck me as very interesting because the Kra Canal I've heard about since I served in the army in Vietnam in 19, 1968 to 1970, and it just never seems to have happened. You know, it's sort of like Brazil, you were talking about before, Ever since fourth grade social studies, I've been hearing Brazil is a country to reckon with. And now I see many problems with Brazil. I think it's a little bit overestimated. The Kra Canal, I've heard about this for, since 1968. It just doesn't seem to happen. Um, and, and you know, it's also very interesting, um, this, the rail connection. Okay, now just last week, China signed a deal with the Thailand. Thailand to start building this railway, which Ice ultimately they want to run down through to Malaysia to Singapore. Singapore. Yeah. Um, what else can we expect here? <laughs> well, this is part of what I call China's infrastructure diplomacy, okay. and there is no counter to that. China, that's why China set up Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to fund some of these projects. Uh, um, you're talking about some countries having great potential. You know, Brazil, India have always had great potential, and they will always have potential. Uh, China is the only one that has been able to realize its potential. Absolutely. Uh, that's where China's grand strategy comes in, and other countries are not able to uh, show that kind of determination, long-term vision, and uh, persistence as China has. Kral has been talked about for 87 years almost, you know. It has been on the drawing board for a long period of time. But uh, my friends uh, in uh, uh, Thai government uh, circles tell me that uh, every Thailand, every Thai Prime Minister has been advised against going ahead with this project Why? for you know, two major reasons. One is the geopolitics. The other is... Geopolitics with Malaysia? Yes, with Malaysia, Singapore, okay. Burma. But the most important one is the religious fault line that Thailand has within the country. Where Thailand wants to build this canal, it used to be Patani Islamic Kingdom that was annexed by the Kingdom of Siam. Oh. As you know, Pulo, Patani United Liberation Organization, has been fighting for a separate Islamic right. state, right. north of Malaysia, south of Thailand. Right. Predominantly Buddhist Thailand has this problem on its hands in southern Thailand. And that's where the canal is going to be built. China has offered to build this canal for Thailand. For, they have offered to spend all the money, 20 to $25 billion have been talked about. So have Koreans, Japanese, Indians have also expressed interest if Thailand wants to go ahead with this project. But the problem with that is religious fault line that exists within Thailand. Instead of earning any revenue from building, by building this canal, Thailand might see physical dismemberment of that part of Thailand. It could lead to the creation of a separate 
Pathani Islamic State. Mm. So this fear of countries' disintegration, dismemberment, is what prevents Thailand from going ahead with this project that has been talked about for decades now. Mm. Interesting, interesting. That, that's, uh, uh, thank you very much for that. I, I, I really find that quite interesting, quite interesting. Um, we're going to take another break here. Um, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Mohan Malik, uh, Professor of Asian Security at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. We're having a really great discussion. Um, revolves around a lot um, of, uh, of his uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, which is uh, given in a couple of uh, different uh, places, uh, PACOM, et cetera. And it's a really great discussion. Don't go away, because we'll be right back. Hi, everybody. I'm I.C. Davidson. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. One of the things that we try to do here is promote civic engagement. How do we do that? We put on shows weekdays from 12 to 5 p.m. Um, we let people in, in our world on Facebook and all the social media. Today, I'd like to talk to you about another way that you can engage us here at Think Tech Hawaii and help us promote civic engagement here in Hawaii. Um, what you do is you get on Twitter. You follow us at Think Tech HI. And during the day, between weekday, weekdays between 12 and 5 p.m., you can interact with each of our live shows. What does that mean? You can send us questions, comments, thoughts, experiences, anything. All you have to do is mention us on Twitter. We'll see it here in the studio, and our hosts and guests will address them accordingly. This is a, a big thing for us. We want to hear from you. The conversation doesn't start here when our show ends. It ends when everybody gets their say. Join us weekdays, 12 to 5 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. Join in the conversations live with Twitter, at thinktechhi. Thank you for watching. We appreciate your support. See you soon. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our show today, The Struggle for Dominance. Um, uh, essentially, what that's about is uh, China's attempt to uh, muscle the U.S. out of, the, um, of Asia, out of the far western Pacific. Our guest is Dr. Uh, Mohan Malik, a professor of Asian security uh, at the APCSS, the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. We're going to go back to the PowerPoint here. Let's bring up that one with the marginal line in the Pacific. I think this is a really great slide. And building the Great Wall at Sea. And that is so apt. Uh, tell us a little bit about this slide. <laughs> As you know, China is uh, building a number of uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea to consolidate its position vis-a-vis -vis other claimants uh, to the South Spratly Islands disputes. Uh, um, China plans to build about seven airstrips and naval bases in the South China Sea. That's what the Chinese media, Chinese uh, 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 journals have been talking about, strategists have been talking about for some time. Uh, that will give China sea denial capability by the year 2020. And that was Admiral Liu Hua Ching's strategy mm -hmm. as he laid out in the early 80s or mid 80s, 1985, sea denial in the first island chain of defense by 2020 and sea control by 2030 if there is no pushback from other countries. You have to give credit to Admiral Wu Shengli, the current chief of right. Chinese uh, Navy, right. who has implemented his predecessor's vision of building a blue water naval capability and doing that in a very short period of time in such a way that there has been no counter reaction to that strategy. Mm. That's an interesting point. Uh, it is true. China has really come very, very far in, in, in every sense since 1978, since it, it decided to join the world again. Um, economically, militarily, it's position in the world, its influence in the world, it's, it's just really phenomenal. I mean, the Chinese no longer call the South China Sea as a sea scape. They call it the blue 
National Soil of China ชุ่มโกดล้านทูตีชุ่มโกดล้านทูตี The blue national sea of China that's great uh, as you can see uh, Admiral Vice Admiral Yuan Yupai a couple of months ago said the South China Sea as the name indicates belongs to China this was at a conference in London he made this claim and the Uh, first slide shows that up until 1973, China did not have anything in the South China Sea. Um, over the last 40 years, in 74, one year before the fall of uh, Saigon, uh, China occupied the Paracel Islands, mm -hmm. uh, and 1988, one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, China occupied some islands in the Spratlys. Uh, 92, uh, it passed territorial sea law. Uh, 1995, it occupied the Mischief Reef. That was under Philippines control, Scarborough Shoal. Uh, since then, it has been going ahead over the last 40 years as a part as part of its long-term strategy, without provoking any adverse military reaction from other claimants. China has come a long way. This is all salami slicing, exactly. step by step. Have we reached a tipping point? Have we reached a tipping point? Um, it all depends on uh, how. Countries in the region define that tipping point. For Philippines, yes, you have reached a tipping point. Uh, um, uh, that's why Philippines has gone to extraordinary lengths to right. uh, uh, raise uh, its concerns vis-a-vis -vis China's uh, militarization of the South China Sea. Um, but uh, countries in the region have come to depend a great deal on uh, for their own growth and prosperity on the access to Chinese market. And they are not willing to jeopardize their diplomatic ties with China for the sake of these islands, rocks, and, and reefs. That's where we are. Let's take a look at this uh, slide. This slide again shows that uh, uh, China has uh, been investing a great deal. It's not just in the uh, Indian Ocean or the Western Pacific. Uh, China has navy has gone global. China now is a global maritime trading power. And uh, uh, this is uh, the emergence of China from a predominantly continental power into a global maritime power that has global interests. Mm. Uh, that's what this slide shows in terms of the investments. Uh, recently, they signed a deal to build a base in Djibouti. Um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, these Maldives, these countries figure prominently in China's uh, uh, maritime strategy for the Indo-Pacific. But it is not limited only to the Indo-Pacific. It goes all the way to the Atlantic uh, Ocean, too. It's, it's a, an attempt to globalize. Yes. Uh, let's move on to the next slide here. Um, so briefly, what's this one about? This slide uh, is about the current maritime order that is uh, uh, facing major challenge. Uh, from China's uh, actions uh, in the South China Sea, but also, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, Philippines has gone to the International uh, Tribunal on the Law of the Sea uh, to challenge China's actions in the South China Sea. International maritime order rests on three pillars. First is laws, rules, norms, codes, and standards, UNCLASA. United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is the most important one. one. Uh, Declaration of Conduct in the South China Sea that came into being in 2002. Um, Then you also have global regional institutions, uh, International Maritime Organization, for example, International Maritime Bureau, uh, Regional Organization, East Asia Summit, uh, ADMM plus eight, uh, that's ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting plus eight, dialogue forums. A number of dialogue forums have come up uh, mm -hmm. uh, in recent years, over the especially uh, last decade. A number of countries have come together to engage in cooperation in Trilateral settings, mini lats, trilats, quads. For example, U.S., Japan, Australia, India have come together. Uh, U.S., Japan, Australia, uh, Korea, Japan, U.S., Indonesia, Australia, India. Mm. Then you have Japan's growing military cooperation with the Philippines and Jap and Vietnam. Russia has its own mini lats with ASEAN countries, with Russia, with Pakistan. It conducts joint military exercises in the Pacific under SCO. So you see countries forming this informal. They are neither allies nor adversaries, but coming together in smaller groupings to deal with maritime issues, geopolitical issues. Let's let's um, if we can and um, let, let's go to slide 19, which is called lessons learned. 
because I, I think in your uh, in your explanation that we uh, essentially covered some the essence of some of the uh, slides in between. Yeah, which was this part, right? We, we yeah. talked essentially about that. Mm. Um, lessons learned. This is a really interesting. One. What I'm saying here is that most, uh, if you look at uh, most cases that have been brought before the International Court of Justice or before it lost, uh, have been brought uh, up by small middle powers, not by uh, major powers. Uh, so China is quite annoyed over Philippines seeking international arbitration, but that's what small and middle powers do. Right. Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Burma, Bangladesh, they all took their disputes to, for international arbitration. Um, and it's not that China lays its claim to the South China Sea on the basis of uh, history, but um, history is a very complex, contentious uh, you know, issue. Uh, whose version of history is correct? The word history in English language is made up of two words, his story. <laughs> story and right. Many feminists <laughs> would argue that uh, in this age of political correctness, we shouldn't be using uh, history. Um, they should be calling it human story, if not her story. Uh, but the point is that history is all about who grabbed or stole what last from whom. That's what history is all about. Mm. So these countries that have settled their maritime disputes with their neighbors, they decided to put their 100 years old claims, 1,000 year old claims aside and reconcile their historical claims with UNCLOS. So uh, that's what we want to see. And if you really want to solve these disputes, then you have to put aside history, historical narratives that are mostly self-serving um, and reconcile those historical claims with UNCLOS. Mm. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Um, let's, go, let's go on to the next slide then. Uh, unrestricted warfare. This is uh, um, uh, what is going on in terms of, uh, we started off by saying that uh, revisionist, I just have two minutes left. revisionist powers are uh, trying to expand their frontiers, waging three-dimensional warfare in gray zones, blue soils, and black holes uh, without resorting to the use of force. Uh, there's a book by two Chinese uh, PLA colonels called Unrestricted Warfare that has been read by all Chinese leaders, Chiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping. It talks about uh, the fighting without really fighting a war, winning without fighting, that there are no rules in warfare. Right, right, no rules. Right. Yeah. Well, we're coming down close to the end of the show here. And before we get there, I do want to, uh, can we get this on the camera here? Um, um, Mohan um, uh, recently edited this book. As you can see, it's called Maritime Security in the Indo-Pacific Region. Uh, it's published by RomanAmazon.com. And it'll give you some uh, additional insights to uh, China's uh, growing role in the uh, South China Sea and what it hopes to uh, accomplish there. And did I get that straight? <laughs> okay. We got about 30 seconds left here. Anything else you want to add here? Um, I just want to thank you for in, uh, inviting me back uh, on your show. And uh, it's always great to exchange uh, views uh, on uh, what's happening in the Asia Pacific region. Um, there are uh, over the long term, I think that uh, uh, we are not going to see any major uh, major uh, eruption uh, of violence, mainly because the regional balance of power is likely to remain in favor of US friends and allies. Great. But in the short term, you're going to see a lot of tensions and how we manage those tensions that will uh, uh, ensure that peace is maintained and stability is maintained in the Great. region. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for joining us today. Um, it's, uh, we're really glad we could uh, uh, persuade Mohan to come back on the show. It's been a while since he's, he's been with us, but I think you agree this is a great show today. There was a lot of good information there, all based on his wonderful PowerPoint. And we'll see you next week and have a good holiday. Thank you.